Chapter 2 Fractured Existence I started making preparation for my impending incarceration. With my two daughters, Duli and Ridula, I went shopping for prison life in the Kacha Bajar behind Gulshan Shopping Arcade. In a matter-of-fact way, as we had done so many other occasions, holding silently within us the gawning pain and the muffled anguish, we browsed in a strained casualness and finally bought a thin mattress, a bed sheet, a pillow, and a mosquito net that could all be rolled into one, my silent companions of the dystopia that awaited me. It was purchase less than a thousand taka, yet so filled with emotions, a stark reminder of an unjust parting that lay ahead. Separately, Ridula had gone over a list of essentials, toothbrush, paste, shaving needs, clothes, etc. Keeping in mind the harsh rules of jail the British had legislated centuries ago that only allowed bare necessities and packed them in a small bag. My elder sister Fatima Appa and her husband Mubin Bhai, who lived next door, came over to our apartment almost every evening, their anxiety mounting as they watched me slip away from their folds helplessly. My elder brother Mahmoud, once a diplomat, long settled in Canada, could not put himself together to call me, and instead kept track of my unfolding misery from Appa. My young brother Jahangir, an engineer and Australian now, inquired about my whereabouts from my family members. I could note his occasional hushed conversation among them, having held me in love and respect for fighting it out in Bangladesh. I guess they could not find words to converse, far less to console me from afar. Babu, a young lawyer and a friend of a friend of Duli's, appeared on the scene as a godsend. He was monitoring on a day-to-day -day basis the development in the lower court to update me and more particularly to forewarn me of imminent dangers. General Wahab, a comrade in arms during the Liberation War, not only shared my evolving story, often with the military abuses hurled at my unseen prosecutors, but had arranged, without my knowledge, prayers for my well-being. All these days, I had been attending the office at UNDP regularly. Although my contracts had expired, a fact known only to few select, I was hoping to keep those tailing me at the bay by giving them the impression that I was a regular UN employee while expecting a new contract anytime soon. My network in UN office, Nojib, Morshed, Anir, Mukta, Rubaiyat et al., who looked upon me as a vernacular friend caught in the web of evil design, served as a shield to comfort in my most trying times. Faced with impending separation, I tried making some pecuniary arrangements for the family. The reality dawned when my bank of over three decades, with callous, suspicious, declined to add my wife's name as a joint account holder to be able to access my meager balance, I guess on the instruction of the government. It never occurred to me that my wife did not have any bank account. Eventually, I managed to open an account for her in another bank and cashed the remuneration check from UNDP, which was a godsend, and deposited the amount, my family's financial lifeline, in my open-ended absence. The waiting finally was over as the end game became obvious. The electronic and print media carried the news that I had been charge sheeted along with Sheikh Hasina. Friends and well-wishers advised me to stay away from home to avoid sudden arrest by the police which I was told was more demeaning than surrendering in the court. I spent a couple of nights with Hasib's family, friend of my daughter, Duli. They welcomed me unhesitatingly and spared a bedroom for me while the family squeezed into the other rooms. After days of suspended existence, I decided to wait out for the perpetrator at my own residence. Kaji a decorated freedom fighter who belonged to the ace commando group that drove deadly fears in the hearts of Pakistani army in the Dhaka city during the liberation war and had survived many a close shave with death, could not accept my helplessness or that matter his in not being able to come to any help. On his own, he visited the DGFI office looking for some acquaintances. He met a brigadier who had been sidelined and expressed his inability to help Kaji was seething with anger and asked me what more he could try. I was afraid that Kaji, 
a daredevil that he once was, would not hesitate walking into the hornet's nest and landing a few punches on someone he felt responsible for the dirty tricks being played on me. Worried about his safety, I asked him to back off, to step away from his initiatives. Buri was among those who were most visibly upset with my plight. A couple of days before I finally walked into prison, Buri came over to her apartment and caught up with me in the parking lot. With tears rolling down her face, she hugged me, holding me by my waist, for she could only reach up to that height. She had cursed those mean fellows who had dared to conspire against me and prayed for my well-being. With measured calm, I assured her that everything would be okay. Once a warrant of arrest had been issued against me, my family and informed well-wishers convinced me to move to a safe location in preparation for surrendering to the court in order to avoid the hassle and the ignominy that police arrest typically was. Sabu and Shafiq suggested their company rest house in Baridhara in the diplomatic enclave. I drove to the gate and changed my mind. During the liberation war, leading a guerrilla group, we would settle, say, in a rural school as the villagers watched but decamp in the middle of the night to some location away lest our position was compromised. The embedded security sense in me was warning. I turned away from the gate of the rest house and drove to Sarwar Bhai's residence, a friend of my late brother Kudrat and one of few who had played a surrogate role for my lost brother for all these years. I stayed there two nights, tried to keep myself busy browsing books and started reading one of them, Michael and Natasha. The Life and Love of the Last Tsar of Russia, a romantic tragedy made intensely poignant in the vortex of the turbulent times of Russian Revolution. But the time hung heavy and I wanted my waiting to be over, once and for all. January 16, 2008 After a quick breakfast under the silent watch of Nelly Bhabi, I got ready to move. Sarurbhai held me in the tight embrace, found no words. Visibly shaken, he kissed me on my forehead, holding back his tears, and let me go. For a brief few moments, it crossed my mind that I was about to commence my journey from the world of freedom to one in chains, from the land I have fought to liberate to a prison cell meant for the unwanted. But for stern reality started dawning upon me as I got into the car with two companions. Shohid, a wounded freedom fighter who could not abandon his leader, making his final tragic journey. And Rajon, a young doctor, my daughter's friend, to deal with an eventuality on the way. As the city rolled past the window of the car, I was moving away from her, the city I had grown up and lived in for nearly half a century, the trustee of all my memories, remembered or forgotten. I was receding fast away from my known world. My mind was floating, drifting to an unknown destination and a sure one. I felt like passing my own sentiments to friends and quickly typed an SMS. I am about to appear before the court to be sent to jail. Pray that I do not lose faith on the anchors I built my life on, truth, beauty and justice. How far am I from the court? I asked since I was busy typing SMS. We are just about there, but it would take about 10 minutes more because of the traffic jam. And remember, it's old Dhaka. I was taken by their matter-of-fact tone, although it was 10 more minutes of borrowed freedom, a treasure I was about to lose. I picked up the cell phone and started sending many SMSs as I could. My last call of resigned protest muted in the apprehension that in the afternoon of my life, the sunshine that inspired me, brightened my vision and had put my thrills in my veins should be in doubt. A few silent replies came, giving me courage and support, but I was drifting away. I went past the deputy commissioner's office, the same premises from where I started my career 40 years back as a young assistant commissioner whose responsibility included that of a magistrate. I looked up to catch the glimpse of the office room by the roadside I had set out on my life's journey, which had now come to full round. The passing scene of old Dhaka, the crowded streets, pedestrians, rickshaws, push carts, baby taxis, cars, buses, all jostling shoulder to shoulder, were from a movie about to come to an end. 
Asma, Duli, Fahmi and their friends joined me in the office at the bar association in the court compound. Lawyers were cracking jokes around, sharing court gossips, while lemon tea was being served. Just another day in the court premises. In the midst, I could catch the stunned, frozen, watery eyes of those who had come to see me off. Among them was Nusrat, Duli's childhood friend, a chemical engineer whom I often complimented as the first woman to work at an onshore control room, remotely managed an offshore gas platform, and her husband, Ononno, just married. Also Onik, a computer engineer, another of Duli's friend, wearing his occasional beard. I held my composure. All the waves of emotions were welling up inside me. A crowd of questions raced through my mind, vying for attention, for answers to the unjust process that was taking hold of my life. I had no time. The General Secretary of Bar Association, donned in a black gown and had his looks in concealment, asked Asma and me to follow him to a nearby room. The teak panel library had a patrician and grave appearance. Do you know what you're heading for once you surrender to the court? He inquired and added, It's a tough life that you have never experienced, full of humiliation and hardship. You don't look like one ready for this ordeal. After a pause, he continued, looking out through the wood-paneled window, rather absent-mindedly. I can arrange for you to leave the court premises, unnoticed, and help you to get across the border of Bangladesh safely. I recommend you think it over seriously. My wife, eyes brimming with tears, replied instantly. We have thought over. He would like to surrender to the court. The lawyer, in avuncular affection, lowered his eyes and said, So be it. God bless you. We walked back to the Bar Association's office. Led by a procession of lawyers and my family, I walked a couple of hundred yards in the courtroom. Gallows of my freedom and faith, dazed at the transformation that awaited me. I walked into the dock at the far end of the courtroom. As the proceedings started, loud exchanges took place between the judge and the team of lawyers. While I paced a small confines of the dock, I could feel the groans in the caged tiger in me, buried under the weight of my age. Looking away from my loved ones, I stood in stoic indifference, made up to defeat the occasion. I had a quick rehearse on my way to the court that I could tell the judge. Your Honor, how much time do I have? Ten minutes? A curt reply from judge. Well then, let me tell you a story. 37 years back when Bangladesh, then the East Pakistan, was in the throes of its quest for independence, when tyranny, exploitation and betrayal had gone away the edifice of an absurd country, young men and women in a sleepy frontier corner were preparing to rise in arms. Among them was a young man of 26 Still a stranger to the place but equally inspired, a civil servant by profession, supposedly trained as a standard bearer of Pakistani regime. In one bold move, he switched sides, abandoned his security and comfort. Legacies of the British Raj in what was then called the Civil Service of Pakistan (CSP) and took over the leadership of the armed movement. He chose to settle his scores with the enemy that was a professional army with guns, a game he was yet to learn. But his heart into it, he has learned it fast and well and was honored with the decoration of gallantry of war, Bir Bikram. The place was Meherpur, among the least known spots in East Pakistan, tucked into the northwestern border with India. This young man had quite a trist in his destiny. It was only in 1971 that Bangladesh got its own first ever government in its history goes back many millennia. Your Honor, the young man that I just mentioned was among the first midwives of this newborn government, organized, choreographed, and facilitated the first government of Bangladesh under the canopy of mango trees in Bhuddhunath Tala in Meherpur, what would later be known as Mujib Nagar. The courtroom was getting impatient at the story of an anonymous young man. I have nearly come to the end of my story. This young man, back from a bloody war, Having won his motherland, his desh, lived through a year of dazed realities, recounting the many lives he lived in 1971, the triumphs and the tragedies, the losses and the reunions, till he gave his heart to a dreamy, wide-eyed teenage serenity, warped in the loud, rapturous laughter, as if to welcome the new dawn. 
he moved on in life and went to study abroad at Harvard to do his doctorate. Five years of nerve-wracking studies got him the degree, and he was ready to fly back to the students. Professor David Bell, one of his supervisors and one of the time cabinet appointee of John F. Kennedy, the romantic U.S. president of Camelot days, asked him endearingly, You surely want to go back to Bangladesh? Yes, replied the young man with 12 more years on his shoulder since 1971. The old professor with filial pat pressed, But you have such opportunities here, and with a doctorate from Harvard, all the gates are open for you to try. Think carefully. I have thought through. I am still tied to the umbilical cord of my motherland. If it is snapped one day, I shall think of your offer. He flew back home, served in public office, raised a family of two daughters, putting them through vernacular schools, fearing that fanciful charm of elite school might draw them away abroad early on, and retired to where his father had retired four decades ago, at Bonani Dhaka. The judge had come to the limit of his patience. Six years into retirement, at 63, that young man is here today, standing in the dock before you, his dreams and life on indictment. Your Honor, are you getting tired listening to these tales, while yours is spent on dispensing justice? Interesting. Go ahead. Once in a while, it's a pleasant break. The judge's response in a sleepy voice. I'm done. My last memory recall, Your Honor. Over two and a half millennia ago, in the faraway city of Athens, Socrates, the great Greek philosopher, was being sent to prison when his powerful friends suggested that he run away from tyranny that awaited him and even offered him safe passage. With stoic firmness, Socrates gave his straight answer, Friends, I was one of those who made Athens what it is today, the avant-garde of civilization and intellectual leader of the world. I cannot walk away from it. Even if tyranny awaits me, you know the rest of the story. Before I walked into the court today, a well-wisher of mine called my wife and me to a safe corner and whispered, Are you sure you want to surrender to the court? Go away. Run away to another country and fast. I can help you. You won't get justice here. Inspired by Socrates, I stood firm on my ground. No, I was born here. I helped liberate her. This is my mother. I cannot run away from her. She is my destiny. It was my duty to advise you, to forewarn you, but it's all your choice. God bless you. I have never had a chance to utter a word, not to speak of making a statement before the judge, as if he knew everything or his time was much too precious to be spent on listening to one of those accused. The learned judge gave his decision. My prayer for bail was denied, and he ordered that I be sent to jail. As I stepped out of the dock, a policeman came forward, and then a few more, to take me into custody, that split second that changed my status from a free man to a prisoner. I assure you dignity, the first policeman whispered as he led me to the prison van. As I boarded the van, a steel cage with only a silver of opening, Running along the roof, the sound of padlock announced my transition to a new life. My known world vanished. At the prison gate, a few minutes' ride from the courthouse, Duli and Fahmi were waiting with my belongings that we together had purchased at Kacha Bajar, rolled tightly in a mat, and managed to throw it at me as if the ship was steering away from the jetty. In no time, the grim, half-lit cavernous entrance of the colonial era, built for shock and awe, devoured me like a hungry dinosaur. In a corner, an officer filled in the forms while I sat on a rickety chair. As I emptied my pockets, I could sense the design to strip me of my pride, dignity, even part of my identity. Dazed, I complied. A TV monitor in an enclosed space displayed prison services, bakery, bail information, etc., With an ache in my heart, I was reminded of my just abandoned assignment at UNDP, promoting e-governance, a blurred continuum between reality and fiction. I walked inside as if beamed by Captain Clark of Star Trek to a parallel world. This time machine was teleporting me to another world, turning me into smithereens, 
to be reconstructed as a prisoner and outcast, a lawbreaker and thus unwanted in the company of free citizens, a risk society chose not to take. Dr. Lisa Randall, the first tenured woman professor of physics in Princeton University and now a professor at Harvard, laboring to reach the parallel world in rapt passages, could find some cues inside the prison walls. A short walk in half-consciousness through the jail compound took me to another walled area, a two-storied building. I was taken upstairs, for a dozen inmates welcomed me and laid my belongings on a cot in the middle aisle. Keeping my cool and wearing a smile, I exchanged pleasantries and took to settling down. Since I did not have any plates to eat, nor had any food to be ordered, the inmates eagerly shared the meager evening meal with me. Later the guards came, counted us aloud, as if animals in a pen, locked the two iron doors from the outside and left. Under glaring lights, I went to bed and slept.